Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm Barb Ackenbaum, and I'm the executive director of Staying Put in New Canaan. And I think some of you know who we are, most of you do, but we're a nonprofit here in town that works with seniors, helping them live safely in their homes and actively engaged in the community as they get older. And so some of the things we do are transportation, taking people to appointments, and we do events for them, and we, we do handyman help and that kind of thing. But we also do programs for the community, and this is one of those. Um, where we try and get out and reach different or audiences, not just our seniors who are like average age 85, um, but also we talk to adult children, which is all of you, about kind of the issues you're facing. And that's really how we, Ellen and I met, um, we met at like an executive, one of the yeah, um, nonprofits. nonprofits, and we started talking, and she was new, and I'd been around a little bit of time, and she was talking about what she did at CARES. Ellen, I should be introducing her, Ellen Brzozowski, <laughs> who's the executive director of CARES since uh, last June, right? Yes. And, and then I was telling her what I do at, at Staying Put, and we were like, well, we're kind of doing the same thing. You're, we're getting the parents organized so that they can get the kids out the door. And I said, yeah, and we're getting the parents organized so they can take care of their parents forever. Mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and so it's kind of a, but in a lot of ways, you know, we're both dealing with dependence and independence, and, and so we thought it would be nice to sit down and just have a little chat about that. So um, I'm just going to, I had some remarks, but I'm just going to kind of flip through them. Um, we have three panelists here today. And uh, I think they're each going to talk a little bit about um, being part of the sandwich generation, right, which is just trying to, you know, we, technically, the, sand, the, the idea of the panini generation, we were trying to be clever. But it's really about, um, there is something called the sandwich generation. The term was actually coined in 1981, um, which is when people started living long enough that their parents were, you know, my grandparents all died before 75, right? And, but all of a sudden, you get to the 80s and people are living to be 80 and 90 and even 100. And so there becomes this new role that's created for adult children who never really had to worry too much about their parents because they, they weren't around anymore, unfortunately. So that's where the term came from. You're being sandwiched between those two, um, those two places. And I just, um, I'm just going to give you, let me just give you, I'm going to just talk for two seconds about caregiving because I think it is um, important for you all to hear about you know, what other people in your, in your generation are, are facing. Um, there are about 65 million people, 35% of the population, who currently provide care for a chronically ill family caregiver or disabled or aged family member, um, usually spend an average of 20 hours per week providing care. And about 75% of them, do you guess, are they women or men? Women. <laughs> and the estimated economic value of their services in 2013 was $470 billion. You know, they had this study they did in Norwalk um, because they, people weren't coming to work and they wanted to find out what their child care needs were. And so they had this little discussion meeting with some of the workers and local workers and it turned out that 50% of them were staying home because they were taking care of their parents, not their kids. And that's, so they changed the policy a little bit there, which was great. Um, so, but I think what we're going to do is just, I'm just going to introduce each of the panelists and, uh, and then we're going to talk about um, this issue from different perspectives. So first panelist, is she's not sitting next to me, she's sitting there, <laughs> Kathy Collins, uh, who is a recent graduate of Southern Connecticut State University, where she earned a licensed master's in geriatric social work. After a career in marketing and public relations, Kathy took a long, long turn caring for aging parents and her sister and became interested in advocating for the needs of older adults. Lucky for me, that led Kathy into the Staying Put office, where she served as director of member resources from 2014 until two weeks ago <laughs> when she left us to become a full-time social worker, um, which had always been her plan and which she's absolutely, you can't talk about that tonight too much because she's just, <laughs> she's just too happy. Um, she's, she loves it. She's overseeing patients in subacute care at the Lord Chamberlain Nursing and Rehab Center in Stratford. And it's really a perfect role for her because Kathy is exceedingly skillful and, at creating tools to help families navigate necessary and often challenging situations. And that's what you're going to talk about now. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, welcome everyone, glad you're here. I hope we can all share some of our experiences this evening because it um, would be nice if you can hear some other perspectives on this issue. I was going to talk about a couple of things and what to remember, caregiver roles, expectations, and setting boundaries, but um, since it's more of a discussion type uh, environment, I'm just going to touch on these a little bit and then pass it on and then we can, you know, get into more things as we're, as we're talking. So a couple of things to remember are, well, one is that your parent, even if you're involved in their care, is always your parent and they don't become a child just because you're taking, helping to take care of them. So just remember to um, treat, treat them as an adult and 
to remember to help others treat them that way as well. I can give an example of when my mom wasn't well and I would take her to a doctor's appointment. The doctor would examine my mom and then turn and start talking to me. And so instead of saying, well, please talk to my mom, I would just turn and look at my mom. So that was forcing the doctor to then turn and address my mother. So it's, it's not as if she was the child. She, you know, she's the patient, she's the adult. Yeah, don't make her invisible. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that if you're caring for your parent, um, for whatever reason, whether it's because you love them, you know that they would have done it for you, the fourth commandment, thou shalt honor thy mother and father, whatever your reasons are, it's important to, to remember that it is a choice you're making to provide that kind of care and that it's, it's not something you got stuck doing or something that you, um, you know, were forced into. It is a choice. It's your choice that you're making to help them. And looking at it in that way can empower you and, and make it a little bit easier to do the kind of work that you do as a caregiver. Because believe me, there are people that don't help. And they may be the only child or they, you know, may, one parent's well and the other's not. And the kids are not going to be involved. So, so the, you know, you're, you're making the choice to do it. It's, it's not, you're not a victim. You're, you're, you know, willingly doing, doing this. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. So um, as far, far as caregiving, I'd say the biggest goal is to enable and empower your parent to live as independently as possible for as long as possible, given their mental and physical capabilities, their true mental and physical capabilities. So um, it's Im important to um, think about um, helping them maintain their dignity as they're aging, helping them maintain their quality of life. And, and two ways to do that is, is to be mindful of what's important to them and what makes life meaningful for them. Um, again, thinking of an example with, with my parents, um, as they did decline and there were certain things they could no longer do, there were still things that they loved to do. Uh, they loved to go for walks on the beach. Well, it got to a point where they couldn't walk anymore, but we had caregivers and I was fortunate enough to have help. And we brought them to the beach and they were both in wheelchairs and it was a gorgeous day and they're walking, you know, they're, we're pushing them in the wheelchairs and they're holding hands. And I, it's one of the last pictures I have of my parents together, smiling at the beach, holding hands. And so even though there were other things they weren't able to do, that was still a meaningful thing for them in their lives and, and something that brought joy to me, some, a memory I'll, ha I'll share, you know, that, that they had. Um, caregiver roles, a really important one is being an advocate. And that can be a tough one. I'm, I'm sure all of you here are partly here because you've had the experience of being an advocate for your, for your parent. And if you haven't yet, you will. Um, two big things that helped me when I was advocating were knowing what all of my parents' medications were and any chronic illnesses or conditions that they had. Because when you go to the doctor or you go to the hospital or anywhere else, they're always asking. Why are you laughing? Yep, okay. <laughs> so they're always asking for that information over and over again. So what I did was I typed all of their medications and I typed up all their different illnesses and surgeries and all that, and I made copies so I had it all the time. Now, if you don't wanna be that organized about it, you can just snap a picture on your phone of their medication bottles so you'll always have it with you. That, that's a, another thing to, that, that can be helpful. Um, <laughs> Okay, knowing about their medications conditions. So, so knowing those things, what their conditions are, what their medications are, and how they affect them can help you to anticipate needs and help you to understand any kind of changes they may have, whether they're physical or mental or emotional changes. Um, some of the medicines my parents were on, there was one my dad was on that when he stood up, he got dizzy and he, he was more of a fall risk. So we had to constantly you know, be reminding him he had to stand up slowly, he had to wait a minute before before he could take a step. So if we weren't aware of how that medicine interacted with him, he probably would have fallen a heck of a lot more than, than he did. Um, if you are an advocate for your parents and they end up going to a hospital, you will want to make sure that you're 
appointed a healthcare advocate or that they'll give you permission to interact with their doctors and nurses and make sure that's recorded in the file because otherwise you're not gonna get the information you need and if your parents get into a situation where they're not able to speak for themselves, you might not be able to get the access to help them. Um, my husband, when I was reading this to him today, he's like, that's great, but what about the players? They've got to know about the players. And I'm like, oh, you're right. So he, what he means by that is the all... Yes, you can make sure, but another thing to do is if you could become your mom's health care advocate, and that's a form you can download from the internet, have her, have her sign it. Uh, it might be in the file, it might be in our five wishes, and, and, and I made a copy of that on my phone, and I also carried it in my um, car so that whenever they went to the hospital, I'd have it, but it, it, we became frequent flyers at Norwalk Hospital, and then they were just in their records. Um, but it's a, it's a good thing to have. Uh, so what my husband was talking about when he said the players, he meant all the people that are involved in your parents' care when they're in the hospital. So um, when after, after a while, like, I, I realized that I had to find who the discharge planner was or the social worker or the case manager so that when my parents got admitted, I'd know how much time they had before they were going to be you know, released, because sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's a week, some, sometimes, you know, you don't hear until you go to visit them one morning and, and they've got a suitcase packed for them and they're ready to send them on their way. So if you are in contact with the social worker or the discharge planner, case manager early enough, then you can say, gee, give me a call when? Are you thinking about, you know, discharging? Or what, what is the plan? Are they going to be able to go to a subacute facility for some kind of skilled nursing after this if they need it? Sometimes Medicare will pay for that. Sometimes it won't. Um, this leads to another point. It depends on if your parents have been admitted for observation or truly admitted to a hospital. Is everyone familiar with that? with Medicare, okay. So, um, we talk about five wishes before? Sure, sure. It does have a medical director. Okay, excellent. So, um, we have copies of this, and if you don't have it, I think you could, you could download it, but we also have copies at the Staying Put office, and you can pick it up. And this talks about um, the person I want to make care decisions for me when I can't. So it's something you could go through with your parents. And um, right here, yeah. talks about the healthcare agent. So if they filled that out and, and you signed it and they signed it, then you would be able to get access to their records at the, at the hospital. And it, and it talks about specific kinds of care make choices for me about my medical care, interpret any instructions I've been given, et cetera. Um, so this is a really good book to have, and if you, if you, um, if there aren't enough copies, you should definitely, definitely get some. But as I did say, the front page does have that, does have that form, and I believe it is accepted in the state of Connecticut. This one, okay. Uh, yeah. Please. Okay. So, um, getting getting back to uh, the hospital, I'll talk about uh, observation status. Means that you're in the hospital, but they haven't admitted you, so they're just observing you. And they can do that for a couple of days. They can do that for a week. If you're not admitted to the hospital and you need skilled nursing care afterwards, and you want to go to a subacute facility to do that, Medicare will not cover it. Medicare will only cover skilled nursing facility help after you've been admitted to a hospital and been in for three full nights. So whenever your parents are going to the hospital, you always want to say, are, have they been admitted? Or are they being observed? And you want to know when, if, you know, if they are observed for two days and then they are admitted, you want to start counting because that, that'll give you a better idea of whether or not they'll be eligible for um, subacute care covered by Medicare. Uh, other players that are involved are your um, parents' doctors, who are very hard to 
see in hospitals. You pretty much don't ever see them. Um, I remember one Easter Sunday, I went to the hospital at quarter to six in the morning and I finally caught a doctor that I'd been trying to see for a week. But there's other ways around that. You know, you, you can ask to see a PA. A lot of times there's a physician's assistant or an, uh, an APRN working closely with the doctor that could provide you with a lot of information about your parents. So try to get the names. Um, I always would go on, at, look at the board in the hospital room and you'd see this is your mom's nurse, this is your mom's uh, CNA, and I would introduce myself to all of them so that they know who I was and I'd give them my cell number so that they could reach me if there was any reason to do that. Um, one time they actually called me, it was pretty funny. My parents were both in the same hospital at the same time on two different floors. They called me to tell me my mother was gone and they didn't know where she was and I said, did you look in room 806? Because my dad's there. Sure enough, she had wheeled herself out of her room down two flights of stairs to see my dad. You know, um, but but it, it you know that was fine with me. But it was a relief to them because they had my cell phone number. They called me, and then they were able to figure out that she didn't run away or get kidnapped or whatever. So uh, let's see what else. Um, okay, healthcare proxy, photos of medicine bottles, company a uh, comp. Oh, okay, it's um Another thing about being an advocate in the hospital is you're providing them with comfort and emotional support. Um, and also, as I said again, the advocacy part is so important to you because you're another set of eyes and ears there. And when somebody's not feeling well and they're in the hospital, they don't always hear everything. They don't always you know, know what they have to follow when they get home. And studies have shown that 40% of patients over 65 had medication errors after leaving the hospital. A lot of times that happens. They will have a list of meds that you go home with and they don't always measure, you know, they don't match up with the meds that they had before. But you know that they still have to be on some of the meds before. But if you didn't know that, they could really be in bad shape. So you, you, you have to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, okay, so a couple of other things, and I'm trying to go fast, and I'm sorry I'm talking so much. A couple of other um, advocacy roles are, are helping to prevent or limit or reduce risk. So um, I, I think in terms of, um, all right, what do you want to prevent? Flu, pneumonia, shingles, all covered, all shots, all covered by Medicare, and all important to to, to have because if they get the flu or pneumonia or shingles and you're older, it's a, more of a risk for complications, uh, increased risk of hospitalizations and or death. Unfortunately, my dad never had a shingle shot and he ended up getting shingles here. Very painful and he had some cognitive issues so trying to remind him not to scratch, not to touch, you know, it was, it was rough. So, um, I think the pneumonia shot lasts five years. The flu is yearly, and then shingles. I think they're two doses, and it's ninety to ninety-nine percent effective, and it's it's lifetime. Um, other areas of prevention would be fall prevention in the home. So one in three people over sixty-five falls every year. Ninety-five percent of hip fractures occur from falls. And falls account for 70% of accidental deaths in people on over 75. So it's really important to try to um, help to prevent those. Now, you know, as we age, our vision changes, our hearing changes, our balance changes, and then there's also health conditions or medications that, um, you know, may throw your balance off. Or in my dad's case, you know, he'd be dizzy when he was standing up. So, so knowing about those things um, can help can help to prevent falls. And also, doing some some things in the home, like putting grab bars in the in the shower if they don't already have them. Um, making sure that there's some sort of lighting from the bed to the bathroom. There was a member of staying put this year who'd recently fallen from her bed to the bathroom. And I said, well, what happened? She said, well, I kind of know the way, so I didn't have any lights on, and, and I fell. Well, this, you know, okay, so I have sensor lights at my house, and they go on, you know, if I, if I get up at night and, and walk to the bathroom so it lights up. So, so simple things like that can, can really um, help to prevent Friend to fall. Uh, oh, oh, this is this was this was good too. This was another staying put member um, to try to prevent falls. Think about what your parents reach for a lot and make sure that things are kind of on that level. Because one of our members, how old was she? 
She's 90 something. Okay, this, this, I love this story. She's like somebody after my own heart. Uh, a friend stopped by, so they decided they're gonna have a drink together and her vodka was, was up on the second shelf of the cabinet. So she got up on one of those footstool things, fell, okay? So if the vodka had been on the you know, shelf where she could reach it, that never would have happened. So it, you know, that, again, making sure, you know, little things like that can help. Um, and, uh, okay, so you can't, you, uh, and a scatter rugs, scatter rugs or any kind of rugs, well, scatter rugs, if you can get rid of them, great. And if you can't, make sure they're secure to the floor because otherwise a, a walker's gonna catch a cane or their foot. Um, and last but not least, as far as this part, if they do fall, if they live alone and, and they're a fall risk, you wanna make sure they have a med alert. Now, my mother-in-law is 85. I'm still trying to convince her to get one. And she said, I'm just gonna say, Alexa, Alexa, call 911. <laughs> and I said, that's great. If you're not in the bathroom, in the shower, where a lot of these falls happen, I said, because Alexa's not gonna hear you, you know, in your living room. She's like, oh, okay, yeah, well, maybe. Still hasn't done it. There's a friend of mine in town. Sometimes I drive him to church. I've been trying to get him to get a med alert. His reason for not getting one, I just wanna go. When I go, I just wanna go. I said, you know, Ed, that's great, except what if you fall on the floor and, you know, break your shoulder and, and can't get up, but you're not going. So you're just going to be in misery for hours. I said, get the, get the med alert. And then if, if, you know, you think you're going, then don't press it. But he still hasn't gotten it yet. <laughs> but, but try to have that conversation, okay? Um, all right, planning. I don't know if any of you have parents that were veterans or, or their uh, spouse was a veteran, but um, my dad was a veteran, and when he was ill, initially his medicines were $800 a month. My aunt in California called me and she's like, what's wrong with you? He's a veteran, get him signed up. We signed him up with the VA, they went to under $50 a month. Yes, you have, to, you have to have been in active service for X amount of time. It's all, if you go to the vet site, you'll be able to see it. X amount of time, is it, was your dad a veteran or your mom? Okay, yeah, you should definitely, definitely apply for, some, for something. Um, yeah, but if, you were, if they were in combat, if they you know, served during various periods of, of wars, yeah, it's, 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 if, if you're, you're, you think your parent might have been a veteran, it's definitely worth looking at that resource. Um, again, Helping with planning, implementing financial and legal planning is so very important, and it's a very uncomfortable conversation because you know you're getting into your parents' personal personal affairs, and and it, it's a tough conversation to have, but it's one you can try to approach. And you could use my example if you want. Um, I've told this to Barb before, and she couldn't believe it. It was heartbreaking. When my dad passed away, I was looking through my mom's papers, and there, I found a life insurance policy for $400,000. Do you know where this is going? I called the insurance company, and we hadn't paid the bill on it in two years. So my father had paid for this life insurance for years. Gone. Something that really could have helped my mother and my sister, gone. If, if, I, if my mom hadn't always hidden papers on me because she was very secretive, very private, didn't want to share any of that information. If I'd known about that, I could have paid the damn bill. I don't know if that story will work on your parents or not, but, but maybe, you know, it's an icebreaker. Think, think of some kind of icebreaker to have that kind of conversation because it's really, really important. And, and, you know, I'm sure my father would have loved it if, if uh, they'd had that access to that, you know, would have made some things a little, little better for them. All right, last for me is adjusting, no, there's two more, I'm sorry. Adjusting expectations, okay. So unrealistic expectations, I love this line. It's assuming a level of control that we don't actually have. It's so true. And it's really true when you have uh, a parent who um, you know, is healthy one day and then all of a sudden something happens and boom. They're, they're going down some kind of, like, they've had a decline. And, and trying to, um, you know, be realistic about where they are and, and what their baseline is now. Because what it had been may not be what it can be now. And, and you know, if you, if you are realistic about that, then, then 
and are resilient and open to the fact that, okay, you know, this used to work, but now, you know, he used to be able to get around with a walker. I know this is a little depressing, but it's part of life. Okay, so, um, pardon? Yeah, so, so they used to get around with a walker, but now they really need to be in a wheelchair. Um, being open to that, being accepting of that is gonna make it a lot, lot easier to do that. So, um, oh, uh, some expectations might seem reasonable, fair, and realistic, but in actual experience, they're not going to be. Again, with my dad, he'd had a brain injury and several mini strokes, and one day my mother said, you know, I think your dad could still drive. I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, if you sit in the passenger seat and just tell him what to do. I'm like, yeah, right, no, that's not gonna happen. So, <laughs> a little unrealistic there. Um, okay, setting boundaries. Uh, you can't control your parents' expectations. You can't control their wants, but what you can control is your reaction to it, your emotional reaction and, and your behavior, okay? So um, my brother and I for months took, took turns uh, sleeping at my parents' house on the weekends because we had care for them during the week and didn't have any for, for the weekends. So we both had young families at the time, both had spouses, and we finally lined up weekend care, and I said, Mom, we've got this wonderful lady coming in for weekend care. I said, what? How come you're not staying here anymore? That's not gonna happen. So let's, you know, I, I set that boundary. I said, no, you're safe. You're going to be safe. You're, you're you know, still gonna be able to enjoy the things you wanna do, but I get to sleep in my own bed and see my kids and my, my husband on the, on the weekend. So, you know, you can't feel guilty about doing those things because you, you, you have to have your own life. And, and it's, sometimes it's really hard hard to do that, but if you don't, then you're just gonna burn out. Um, so uh, again, with setting boundaries, another part of that is making sure that you use every available resource. And for me, it was uh, the church, because they belonged to St. A's, and the priests would come over and visit, and they had other volunteers that would come and visit. Um, we didn't have staying put at that point when they were ill, but I would have certainly used this. It's a phenomenal organization in New Canaan and it can really help you when you have issues like this. It can also help you as far as transportation for your family or social social involvement. Um, let's see what else, community, oh, friends. We, we used a lot of friends. You know, My parents' friends were for the most part gone, but I would call a friend and say, gee, could you help me do this? or see somebody that day. Uh, okay. So when you're setting the boundaries, it's still important to show empathy and support. I was, am I talking too long? Oh, sorry. Um, mom, oh, mom, I, I know, I know you want me to stay here. I know you want me to sleep over, but, but I really, really need to sleep in my own bed and I need to see my kids. So I understand how you feel this way, but that, you know, can't do it. Um, and just, it's just important to, well, two things, take care of yourself and to recognize and give within your limits. The whole medical model is changing so quickly today and there are um, people that I've just seen in just the two weeks that I've been at this job that are going home with IVs where they're training the patient and the families in how to flush it and you know, put it in, how they're, they're t training the families and the patients in wound care. And these are things that Medicare is not going to pay for because they feel that the families can be educated to do it. So if you have resources and you know you can't do that kind of thing, use the resources, spend the money. It, it'll, it'll be better for you and for your loved one in the long run. Okay, that's it. No? Right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. You remind me of I was visiting my parents in Chicago or 89, and I have two sisters nearby who take care of them a lot, and they, they have issues, but they're hanging in. They're in their own little cottage. And as I was leaving, which is always difficult, when are you leaving? You're leaving now? Mm -hmm. My mother says, why don't you just move here and take care of us? Because <laughs> I'm 60, and I have a job, and I have children, and, you know, it's my husband. And, but, that, that, you know, their world gets so small that they just feel like, well, you know, this is nice when you're here, and you're here all weekend, and you're doing everything we need. 
why don't you just move in, you know? So thank you. So you've got to be really careful that you can't get, you've got to be careful, you've got to set some boundaries. I'm sure you're going to talk about that, but it just reminded me when you said that about your parents. Okay, so our next panelist is Julie Reeves, um, who most of you must know. We identified her in our public publicity poster as a panini, but of course she is so much more, not to mention she grew up in New Canaan. Did you go to this school? You went to New Canaan High School? Was it this building? Uh, a version of it. A version of it, okay, yeah. Uh, and. Yeah, and then she went to college at Duke and earned a master's at Columbia and then worked in finance in New York. And then her husband's job took her to Memphis where she became a middle school teacher. And then they were relocated back to New York in 2004. And I guess your husband suggested that you move to New Canaan, which was, which was very nice. Uh, and with their three children who are now 11, 13, and 15. Do I have that right? Close, Close. okay. Oh, okay, That's, that must have been how old they were when you moved. Okay. <laughs> I, didn't, I knew I didn't have it right. Okay. Um, and then Julie, being a very, very dutiful and, and unusual daughter, decided she wanted her parents to live with her. And so they built an apartment for her parents upstairs in her house, which is highly unusual, but very, very generous. And, uh, and unfortunately, your mom didn't live there that long because she became ill. But um, you certainly set up a wonderful environment to have, um, to have the parents in intergenerational activity. And, and uh, I think they were very fortunate. And your dad's fortunate today. Um, but uh, I'm just going to turn over to Julie. She's going to talk about she's firsthand about the demands of, of you know meeting both needs. Thank you, Barb. It's so funny. This is so formal. I was uh, I don't know if any of you read the New York Times, but in the Times this morning they had this uh, like on the inside of the front cover they always have this little here to help section, and it was today it was how to become a better public speaker. <laughs> And if any of you have seen the movie Spinal Tap, they were referencing Spinal Tap, and it was turn it up to 11. So <laughs> it's a little different sitting in a circle than at a podium. Um, so as Barb said, so I'm going to share sort of my experiences of being a panini, which, um, as I was saying to, I think, you earlier, I think basically all of us, if we have children and parents still alive, that that's all of our experiences. And sort of as I was thinking about this topic, I, I was thinking like the difference between the sandwich generation or uh, how the, the panini is a version of the sandwich. You know, the sandwich is when, as I think how, at least I felt when my kids were first born and, and we did move here and my parents were at the time still working and volunteering and relatively healthy and um, we would go over to their house and they would read and they would cook and they would play with my kids. and. Um, I would always feel a little bad that we weren't spending as much time over there as I know my mom would have loved us to spend. But at the same time, you know, it was still okay to leave. But then as sort of health things changed and my children started having more things to do, and to me that's where like the panini, like the heat and the, the pressure and the whatever. So it's a very apt metaphor. So what I have to share is really probably what all of you are at some point either currently experiencing or going to experience. Um, as Barb said, my, uh, my parents live here and when, when we moved here with my uh, kids who were very young at the time, 14 years ago, um, my parents had basically lived in New Canaan almost all of their married lives and they were not leaving here. Like this was where they wanted to be. But um, about six or seven years ago, it became clear that they needed to be in a place that didn't have stairs. Um, they were starting to slow down, and my mom had taken a couple falls, and it just seemed like a good time. Um, and I have two brothers who live, one lives in town, one lives nearby, and through lots and lots of conversations with my parents uh, who did not want to leave their house, but um, we ultimately did make an arrangement so that they could move in with us and um, you know it was it was gonna be great they would have their own sort of part of the house and they would have their independence uh, and then my mom ended up having a stroke and very quickly like within six months um, unfortunately she passed away and so my dad was left with us uh, which was wonderful that he was there and that he, you know, had us nearby and he was in a safe environment. Um, so that's sort of where my family is right now. Um, one of the things that, that I was asked to reflect on is uh, how being part of uh, Panini affects our family. And I think 
you know, you sort of touched on that, Kathy, on, on many of those things. Um, the first being probably the most obvious, but is feeling um, just pressure from all sides, you know, um, especially when my mom was first ill, none of my children were driving yet, so there was just that, you know, you're spending time, uh, I would spend time at the nursing home initially, and then I would uh, be watching my watch the whole time and scooting home to take my kids and making dinner and um, feeling like I was never giving anyone enough time. So, but again, I think that's a very common feeling regardless of whether a parent is ill or not, and I think if your parent doesn't live nearby, you feel it in a different way, you know? Like, as you said, Barb, your mom says, you know, why do you have to go, right? I just, I think it, we feel that pull no matter where we are because it's our parents and it's our children. And, and um, so I think part of this stage is kind of reckoning with that, of, of feeling that way. Um, I think... Part of it, too, is the changing expectations about myself, and I don't remember which one of you said it, but um, at the point just before my mom was ill, I was thinking I was ready to go back to work. And But when she got sick, that I, I had to put that on hold. I mean, I guess I didn't have to, but I felt like I needed to. I wasn't prepared at that point to go off and uh, and start, you know, basically leaving, I wasn't sure who was going to look after my dad at that point. So I think that's something, too, that we have to reckon with. And, you know, for those of us who who do have full-time jobs, that's something different as well. You know, you're leaving your work and you're going to visit your parent if they're nearby or you're on the phone dealing with their doctors if they're far away. I just, it's it's a balancing act and it's, it's very stressful. Um, but I like the way you put it, Kathy, that it's a choice. Most of the, I mean, I, I do think there are times we're sort of thrown into it, but I, I think I think that's part of it if we can kind of turn it and think of it as um, really a gift that it is, um, which isn't always easy. <laughs> um, sorry, let me just quickly see what else. Um, oh, well, and then there's just, this is a sort of part of the same idea, I guess, but um, the guilt about feeling like, you know, sometimes I wish it were just easier, you know? Like, sometimes I would love to just come home and not make anyone dinner and just have my, you know, bowl of cereal or whatever. But, again, we feel like this, I think, when we first have children, too. So it's not unique to being a panini, but I think it's exacerbated once you have them. In terms of what I have, my wisdom gained over this period of time, or what I'd wish I'd, what I wish I had known, you actually, Kathy, talked about a few of the things that I had written down. Um, I think it's really important, hard though it is, to have discussions with your parents, whether they're near or far, about their medications, about their medical wishes, about their medical history, because it all does come into play and it's so much easier to have those conversations when they're healthy than when you're standing at the admit desk at the hospital and you have to you know talk about that or when the doctor says you know what is your mother's end of life wish and you're thinking I have no idea you know so anything you can do to to talk in advance is really really helpful so we had the luxury, I guess, if you call it that, of having learned the hard way with my mom where we hadn't done that. So, you know, I've like slowly been doing this with my dad who um, has was really reluctant at first to have these conversations, but I would I would just kind of make a joke about it. And I'd, I'd just say, you know, dad, you don't want us to have to, you don't want to have to make this stuff up, you know, and it happens to you. So, because just let me know what you want to do. So that I definitely learned. Um, the advocacy thing is huge as well. And I think it, it applies to your kids just in the same way that you would advocate for your children. You learn to advocate for your parents wherever, whether they're in the hospital, whether they're in a nursing home. The squeaky wheel does get the grease. The polite squeaky wheel, you know? I mean, we found when my mom was, uh, was in Wilton Meadows, which is like a, a long-term care place, in Wilton that we got to know the nurses, like knowing the nurses by name, knowing um, 
just the schedule be when you can be there. I mean, again, it's hard if your parents are not nearby, you, you can't do that. But if you can call and get as much information as possible, that's really, really helpful because, um, you know, many of the people who care for your parents are not necessarily medical professionals. It's the paras who mostly are doing the care of your parent in, in a place like that. Obviously in a hospital, they have the medical people, but uh, the more you know about, the more you get to know those folks, you know, they, they'll take care of you. Uh, they are, they are. So um, that was a good lesson learned from, from that experience. Um, and, you know, nothing is forever. I mean, it, you can look at that morbidly or you can look at it as, you know, the stress and the whatever, like, this too shall pass. And so if you could, can sort of keep that in mind, that I don't know, at least that helped me kind of work through stuff. Um, and humor is invaluable. Um, there's actually, uh, it's an hilarious book. I don't know if any of you know the um, cartoonist Roz Chast. She, you, if you don't know the name, you would recognize her cartoons. She's in The New Yorker. She's in lots of different places. She actually lives in Ridgefield. But she... Um, she actually just had a book come out, but her previous book, which was a, um, a graphic novel, it was all her cartoons called Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? It's so, it's for anyone, even if your parents aren't at the point where they're ready to um, move into some sort of care, you will, I, bless you. Um, I actually read it, ironically, right before my mom had her stroke, uh, just because I love her, so I read this book, and. And as the stuff was happening with my mom, I thought, oh my gosh, it's exactly like she says in this book. Um, so I highly recommend that. Uh, and then the other thing is also um, be kind to yourself. And I think even before your parents are ill, but I, I think when we're dealing with all the stress, it's so great, whether it's your spouse that you talk to or a friend who may be going through this, because you'll find that everybody's going through this in some version. Um, I found that really helpful and also to, um, as you said, to have the boundaries and to not feel bad about taking that time for yourself. Like I know for me, because my dad is with us, we have dinner with him every night, which is great. I love it. It's wonderful for my kids, but, and, and, my, and my kids, and I'm not at all trying to throw them under the bus and they've, they've really become so much better. It's now been four years, but there are some times I know where they've got a lot of stuff to do and they just don't want to sit and have a long family dinner because we're, we're big on the family dinners, but it's always longer with my dad and they don't want to have the long conversation. And, and, uh, so there are some nights where I just say, okay, we're just gonna, you know, have dinner just ourselves. Um, and I always feel really bad about that. And, you know, maybe my dad's secretly thinking, yes, I don't, <laughs> I don't have to have the conversation with the kids. But I think that, you know, it's, it's okay yeah, to, right. to draw that. So. Right. <laughs> Probably not. It's okay. Yeah. Um, and I guess my final thought is just, obviously, I don't have all the answers. I mean, I think a lot of times there are no answers. You just you just do the best you can, and um, and that's better than doing nothing. And so, anyway, that's where I where I come from. So. Well, I just want you to know that last night we had a potluck dinner at the Presbyterian Church for thirty three members. So your dad could have joined us. <laughs> he would, you could have had a family dinner, and he could have been with us. It was really good. I'll let you know. He needs to come and be a part of that. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, thank you. Those are really good insights, and it's nice how you both of you dovetail so much with what each other said based on your own personal experiences. Um, our final speaker is Ellen Brzozowski, who joined New Canaan Cares as executive director last June. She's a licensed clinical social worker and most recently spent four years as director of community relations at Silver Hill Hospital. Ellen recognized that she had a calling to help others early. She went straight from being a sociology major at Holy Cross to earning a master's from the Columbia School of Social Work. She then worked for 18 years in the Stanford Health Department managing the HIV prevention program. She's been in her new, new role at New Canaan Cares for just 10 months, but has already established herself as a great leader with a compassionate and practical understanding of what's important to New Canaan families, and also, as I know personally, a great collaborator with other organizations supporting the town. So we're happy to have you. Thank you. Thanks very much. 
Um, so I think um, Kathy and Julie said a lot, um, and I'm probably going to repeat some of it, but from the other perspective, so from being the parent of children while you're also taking care of your parents. So um, we all know that kids don't stop growing, developing, having their issues just because we might have some added responsibility, right? So your child isn't going to say, I'm going to wait to go through puberty, or I'm going to wait to fail that English class until grandma gets better, right? It just doesn't happen. So, so now you have sort of the responsibility of being a parent, which can be daunting in and of itself, and then the responsibility of caring for an, an older parent as well. So the first thing I would say is that you have to really be good at um, embracing imperfection. And, and being okay with it. And, and not everything is gonna go exactly as you want it to go, and that's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm like seeing him. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, you know. Um, but you also have to be okay with letting th some things go, which is what you guys were both saying about limit setting, and you know, you, you might feel that guilt about not being able to spend that, that extra 20 minutes with your parents because you have to go and watch your kid's soccer game. Um, and those are horrible choices to have to make, but you know there are times that the parent's gonna win out and times that the kid's gonna get the benefit. So, um, so I do think even though it's very tough, there are some real benefits from caregiving. So there was a survey done in 2014 of caregivers that found that 83% of caregivers viewed caregiving as a positive experience. So that's very encouraging. Um, not all the time, but, <laughs> but some of the benefits um, they said they felt was a sense of giving back. They um, had satisfaction knowing that their loved one was getting good care. Um, they felt an increased sense of purpose for their life, and also the ability to model care and concern for others. So they were showing their children how to model that and showing their family values um, by taking care of their parents, which is really important. And we talk a lot at New Canaan Cares about modeling for your kids, so that's huge. Um, so stress and emotional distress are definitely a part of this process, and I read somewhere it's been said that grief and resilience live together. So you really do in times of, um, in hard times, that's when resilience comes through. And that's what we say at New Canaan Cares all the time about kids. So I just posted something last week about snowplow parenting and you know how we, yeah, how you're not supposed to try to pave the road for your kids, you're supposed to try to prepare your kids for the road, right? So, um, so I think in that way too, when you're thinking about caregiving, um, really modeling and talking to your kids about, you know, it was hard today being with grandma and she really had a hard time today and I lost my patience. And, you know, I think sometimes we always, we want to appear to be strong and perfect for our kids, but we're not giving them the value of learning that it, it's okay not to be. And, you know, it's okay to say, you know, and then I thought about it and I took a breath and I stopped. So now you're modeling the coping skills, right? Um, and you're saying, and then, I was able to talk to grandma more calmly and we got through it and I asked for help and this is what I did. So all of those things are teaching your kids. So you can use that as an example. Um, and then in 2017, there was another study on caregiving that showed not only sort of those emotional benefits, but the physical benefits of taking care of somebody. And so they said that those who care for others live longer. Um, physical health improves as you br build strength and stamina, so you might be helping somebody with their activities of daily living, like showering or going to the bathroom, or, and that's building muscle mass, and I mean, they were really looking at it from a different perspective. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, you never know. You always have to look for the positive, yeah, right? Yeah. So, um, also, um, it showed that caregivers had uh, sharper minds and improved memories um, from being interactive. Um, so it's just an opportunity to sort of change the channel and try to look at it from a different perspective. And you can't do it all the time, but if you can remember and sort of be grateful, that, that whole gratitude thing is very important for your own mental health. Um, so the, I, I also read an article called Caring for My Dying Father Helped Me to Learn to Embrace the Monotony of Parenting. So she talked about that she realized when she was caring for her father, the feedings that she's had to do, he had Parkinson's, so he had a hard time swallowing, um, the walks to nowhere, providing comfort to someone who couldn't express himself, those were all things she did for her young son, but she also realized those were all things her father had done for her. So um, she came to cherish those monotonous moments with her son because those were moments she realized with her father that mattered the most to her. 
So knowing he was always there on those nothing special days that he was there, um, and watching TV show together or car rides from school, those are all things that then had sort of more of an emotional charge for her when she was caring for her son. So she learned some good lessons there. Um, but, and it's not gonna be, you're not gonna make every game that they play or um, you know, every class party sometimes because there will be that pull to, for mom or dad, but it's the consistency, I think, that is what the kids remember. Um, and then the issue of not having enough time, I mean, everybody has that issue, right? But I think it's doubled then when you have this extra caregiving responsibility. But it's things that both of you have said, let people help you. You know, if, if you're not good at asking for help, try to get better at it because um, you have friends, you have people, social workers in hospitals and centers that are there and that's the reason. And there are friends who will say to you, what can I do? And give them something to do. Pick up my child, make me dinner, you know, that, and I think it's okay to ask for help. And, um, you know, be gentle with yourself. We've, that's a theme that we've been saying. And then self-care is vital, you know, and again, we never have enough time for exercise and all of those things, but if you go for a walk with a friend who maybe is your sounding board, so you're getting both support and exercise at the same time, or you're going for a ride with your kids, you're riding bikes together, you're getting your exercise and you're spending time with your kids. Um, we know that dopamine is released through exercise and that's the feel good chemical that, so that, that's gonna go a long way in hopefully combating your stress too. Um, support groups, therapy, if that is what you need. Um, Staying Put has put out a nice, beautiful resource page that's over there on the table, so take that. It has lots of good information, support groups, things like that. And then New Canaan Cares obviously has parenting programs, and although they're not support groups, they can offer advice and information, and it's also where I hope people can find their people. You know, they can find other people who parent, have similar parenting styles or values, and so you can find those sources of support there too. Um, we also have a great website that has a resource page and has lots of different articles on there about parenting and things like that. And there's also an article um, that is on the table over there that I printed out just about how to talk to children about difficult issues. So obviously if you're dealing with a parent who's failing um, and maybe is having a decline and your kids see that, that's a hard thing to have to talk to your kids about. So. Um, and it's also you're dealing with your own grief and loss at the same time. So again, being gentle with yourself and giving yourself time to process that grief and that loss and then being able to, to talk about it with your kids. Um, and again, it goes back to that modeling, you know, that uh, you want to be able to talk about emotions or have your kids talk about how they feel. So then you need to talk about how you feel too. Now, obviously you're getting your own support somewhere else so you're not falling apart as you talk to your kids about it because that's scary for kids. But it's okay for them to see you cry or to be sad about something. And it's really also really great for them then to see you bounce back mm -hmm. and know this is not forever. You know, we can be sad for a little while and then um, I just actually had something uh, with my, that happened to me on Monday. I, I had, I found out something that was very sad to me and it, it really took me a long time to sort of <laughs> work through it and get over it. And I used my supports. I talked to people about it and then there was an Instagram post of somebody that I really respect and those words were very helpful to me. So tonight at dinner, I thought I was doing this thing and I thought, well, why don't I tell my kids about this? You know, they should know. So I said to them, you know, I was really depressed the other day and it, and it really was hard for me. And I sort of told them what was going on. And my kids are 17 and 20. So again, you have to be age appropriate in what you're telling them. But um, so that, but the 17 year olds, she like right away said, are you better now? You know, she was like terrified that I wasn't okay, you know? And I said, yes, I am. But it, you know, I said, this is what it took me to, to get through. So again, it's that modeling and talking to them about emotions. And it's not, when you're dealing with your own grief, it's not easy. So you don't, don't have to do it right away in the moment that you're feeling the grief. Like I waited a couple of days because I knew if I tried to talk to them about it on Monday, I would have fallen apart. And I, you know, I got teary tonight even talking about it, but I showed them I'm, I'm still okay, so. Um, and then just in terms of death um, and grief with kids, you just, especially the younger they are, you just wanna be careful of the words you use. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, she went to sleep and she's not gonna wake up. Well, then they're not gonna go to sleep because they're gonna be terrified. You know, they take things pretty literally. Um, and, or, you know, they went to be with God, you know, depending on what your religious values are, then they might not wanna go to church anymore because they're mad at God, you know? So you just 
sort of have to think about it. And there's good resources in this article and, and some others that talk about that. But, and you don't have to give them a lot of information. Um, you give them sort of the basics. You don't want to lie to them. You want to tell them the truth. Like maybe grandpa was diagnosed with this and this is what that means. And then you stop and you see what questions they have. Because sometimes that will be enough and they'll be satisfied. And then other times they'll ask you some more and then you can go into some more detail. But um, so I just think it's okay to have a bad day. <laughs> Use the supports that are there. Um, nobody's perfect. Be gentle with yourself, and you don't have to do it alone. I think that's the message we really want you to have from either end, from as a parent or as a caregiver to your parent. All right. Well, I don't have anyone else to introduce, so um, I'm just going to see if anybody has any questions or any experience maybe they want to share or talk about. or It's hard. Go ahead. All right. No. Okay, I'll repeat it if necessary. Mm -hmm. By Atul Gawande, right, being mortal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great book about trying to plan for the end of your life, the very end of your life, and a lot of it is about doing interventions, you know, late in life and trying to really have quality. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a... Do you want to answer that? <laughs> no, there's not a really clear answer for it. I wish I had a clear answer for you. It's a really, really hard thing. But, um, you know, there's, I hate to say go to the websites or, or, you know, Google, you know, what you should look for. But you yourself can see certain things, right? Is it, Are you concerned about someone specifically what are you concerned about their how they're functioning during the day or if are they driving or okay so That's really rough, because you know she still needs the help. So um, have you had any discussions about, do you remember when you didn't have the caregiver, you ended up in the hospital nine times? You've tried all that, okay. That's, yeah, I was gonna say, I did that, what I did with my mom is I said, um, the doctor said you, you can go home, but only if you have 24 hour care. So it's your decision. You can either stay here or go home, but you have to have this care. There's no way around it. I, I, I really wish I had an answer for you, but it's, you know, anyone else have any suggestions? Anyone? Oh. Here, let me, I'm gonna give you the mics. There's other people. It's all right, I can't hear you, so um, one, one of the things we ended up doing, because my parents are together, which is nice to know, and they're definitely cognitively still um, Good, but you know, you're getting concerned, you're getting older. So uh, we approach it with trying to get them someone and develop a relationship, just a few hours a day, develop a relationship so that if and when something does happen inevitably that they have chosen, they are in on the interviews, they get to choose who um, will help care for them and have a relationship and then that person will be more invested in their health and well-being and it would be better for me as a parent of, my, of the young kids, of their grandkids, I can focus knowing someone else was helping them in the morning. It didn't fly right away, but a lot of persistent conversations and um, saying, I need you to do this for me, and we love you, and all of that. Um, ended up, the first one didn't last long. That was, you know, oh, I don't need you. So that was, but the second one has been there, and it's been going okay. So sometimes it's breaking down that first barrier, I think.
Is she at risk of falling, or is she just, you just, no. Yeah. You don't want to turn the stove on and, yeah. Sure. Well, people who are smart can game it really well, right? You know, you can really kind of for a long time, you don't realize. Yeah, you're waiting for an event. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it's not a, ser not a car accident or something, yeah. Sometimes it's what it takes. Sometimes an event has to happen. Then you say, Mom, I knew this was going to happen, and now we have to take action. It does, often. Mm -mm. Well, would you? I mean, I wouldn't want a stranger. I open somebody to go, did you take your pills? You know. <laughs> yeah. Just, just do what you're up for doing and you know what yeah. you want to do. Yep. Yeah. You 
have. But the sibling dysfunction is, is a huge issue because every family has it, and there's oh, always yeah. that sense every of I'm doing more. And yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's like you're more frustrating for people. Yeah. But you know, the one thing you really don't want to have is a point where after you, know, you get so angry with each other and then you lose that those friendships right. because things get so bad. It's so important to try and be on the same page. Oh yeah. You know, with your siblings. We have some stories we can tell. About. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> one story I'll never forget is not really sibling related, but that one of these lovely members of ours who was in her 90s died, and the next day her kids called the office and said, "Do you know whether she wanted to be buried or cremated?" Oh, yeah. And we, they didn't know, but we did. I didn't, but my coworker knew, and and so she told her. I, I don't remember what it was, but anyway. Um, and then you think, wow, they, they trusted us, you know, but they didn't, you know. So you really have to try and encourage those conversations because you just, you know, you want to make sure because then you get into sibling disagreements over that, you know, after someone's gone, and that's that can end family. Exactly. Like, well, material things afterwards. Yeah. Well, that helped out with mom the most. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I get. Yeah. I mean, I have no idea that I definitely am like that whole thing of. Material things afterwards can cause huge yeah. drama. Yeah. So to deal with that ahead of time, like we share a house on a, my parents own a house on a lake, and people are always saying, "Sell it before," yeah. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Or, you or you know, have a real solid relationship, relationship yeah. with the three of you yeah. splitting a place yeah. that your parents. True. Mm -hmm. That's again a whole other okay. thing. Okay. Yeah. So like put on a new roof or something. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> There's yeah. only one of us that has some money, so it'll yeah. only be me. Yeah. 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 What? And we know that, but it's just like, you just have to get over, there's no such thing as fair share, and they do what right. they're up for doing. You have to realize that if you're gonna accept that, then just you have to accept that it's just yeah. gonna. Were you gonna say something? <laughs> well, with the sibling piece, um, you know, we went through all the legal stuff recently with my mom, and she's like, oh, you know, and, and we said, put all the kids' names on, her savings, put all the kids' names on her IRA, or whatever it is. And she's like, well, Hallie's on that one, and you're on this one, and I just figure you'll all figure it out. Nice <laughs> <laughs> you know, jewelry and stuff. She's not going to take it, but she's moving to an independent living place, and she's and she lives with us. And she said, well, you, I just want you guys to do that after I'm gone, and that puts so much on us. Yeah. And it's yes. not right, and it's not. You know, my sister might be like, well, that one only has X in it, and yours has X. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm making sure that everybody's on it equally, and I'm, and she's in the. She can just write down, okay, that goes to who and who. Because it's, it does, even those things have to be brought up before as yeah. And they don't are. want to be bothered. No. They're too, they don't want to have to do anything. Like my mom's like, I don't want to do bills anymore. <laughs> I'm, I don't want to do them. Your dad did them and I'm just, I can't, I don't want to do them. So my husband's doing her bills now. But it's really important in that situation that she trusts whoever she, whoever's yes. doing it. Yes. Yes. She oh, she's she like, Worst, worship spirit. Yeah, but I mean, that is something too. You know, you got to look at as your parents age who's taking care of their finances and yeah, who's got their name on what checkbook because things can disappear. And so it is. It's really and and yeah. my mom was writing $500, or she's writing $500 up here and then $100 in this part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, that was a good time to say <laughs> someone else needs to be in charge. Yeah. But you just want to make sure it's someone who trusts you. But you're right. You don't always have a family member. That. Oh, my yeah. husband wasn't, that, no one else would have been mm -hmm. right. in a position to do that. So I assume mm -hmm. that's what I'm going to have to look into. Yeah. Someone like to do that. Because people aren't going to start doing the bills correctly and all of that. I, don't, I think assisted living, I'm just starting to understand it, that all of a sudden that's going to make it much easier as far as you're not having a big house and you know, all that. So that helps operating expenses, yeah. individual costs. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, um, so my dad does not live in New Kingdom, but I do. And the same, but would you guys help me? He lives in Westchester, and right now it's like a, a, like a 10 volume book on his situation to today. <laughs> and then the other day he said, Well, and now I'd like to go live in an assisted living place. So I was like, S -s 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 <laughs> So <laughs> how? Yeah. But he was in hospice, then they graduated him. Oh, wow. How many people graduated? Yeah, how many people graduated? Yeah, so, and I was like, what? Congratulate me? <laughs> so then that was two years ago, blah, 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 long story. How do I decide now he wants to go to this living? And I have, like, a million pros and cons and reasons why that's a good idea, bad idea. You missed that discussion. We did that about a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> but do you want to talk to him? Yeah, yeah, no, I just, I met, um, I just spoke with course, woman this week, week. Um, whose business it is to help people like your, you know, your yeah. family, uh, your dad, find an assistant 
living facility that suits his needs, his pocketbook, you know, the whole nine yards. So she is familiar with the places in Westchester. She is familiar with the places in Fairfield County. She has a vast network of other professionals that she can network with in other states. And, you know, but also to say, like, you don't fall, like, you're not a right. good idea. So what, what's That's wonderful awesome. about it, no, this is, is you don't pay her. She gets paid by whatever facility he is eventually placed in. So there's nothing that comes out of your pocket. And, and she's not really invested in leading you to any particular yeah. place. So she really takes the time to you know, get to know your father, get to know what he's looking for, what level of independence he you know, wants to have, and just what are his medical needs. It might need some it's called, you know, it's called nursing Oasis. care. It's called Oasis. That's it's called name. Oasis. Yeah. Um, her name is Susan Doyle. So um, if I call you guys, you know, yeah, 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 sure. You can do it. Add state. <laughs> no, I'm, oh, should I be a member of Stay Put in New Canaan? No, no, I'm not a member. Of, like, <laughs> 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 I, mean, I belong to the one that's in Bronxville. It's called Bronxville. Yeah, Bronxville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I don't know. Yeah. No, you can't. You can't join Stay Put here. I mean, it's really just for seniors who live in New Canaan. Okay, but that one can, I belong to there. Yeah, the, and they, you know, they have good resources.
Not could be worse. She could be tougher. Or Gabby, don't throw that away. Yeah, don't throw that away. Right. Well, well, she's doing that too. She's doing that too. Yeah, but you're going to be so relieved when you have her. Oh, my gosh. It's going to be it's massive. Work. But, but part of the, uh, wanting to have it quicker after my dad, I was just that, you know, she'd be more memory things and more, and more like, you don't want her to all of a sudden not qualify. And then, and then what? Yeah, that's really wise. But having said that, you know, we're all about keeping people in their homes. Yes. 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 But Until we can't. Yes. Until we just know and they need more help. My dad was a huge believer in yeah. that. And, and sometimes, so, getting, and people are, if they're healthy, go for it. I think it's, it's when they really start seeing enough signs that you're like, oh, okay. The problem is that they could be, like most, a lot of parents that do stay forever, like mine. My, my dad, there's no way he would have left his house, no matter how bad off. So he just happened to pass away, but otherwise it would have been a nightmare to ever try to get him out. And he did buy his house on just what he wanted. And, but um, my mom's much easier. But yeah, that's like you said, she's social, so she wants very, that. Yes. that and she's nothing. feeling lonely, so yeah. I really, the yeah. lonely thing also kills you. Yeah. 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 She, and and the new girls isn't that much when your kids are young, no. and they don't want to see grandma. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I wish you may improve some. Yeah. 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 It should be like the new world cafeteria. Sit with their meter. The blonde hair. The blonde hair. Now, ready the place we looked at, the guy across the hall is single, and he's made it really clear oh. he's single, and he oh, loves, loves to go dancing. <laughs> and he can't wait to meet my mom. <laughs> oh boy. Take it. 
stayed alone. Don't and it's so alone. take advantage of yeah. resources. Yeah. 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 You don't need to ask for help because we all can yeah. be that way. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of perfectionist. You want to do everything right. Well, when we're not, when my dad was dying, um, what she, he died within three months. He was chopping wood and swimming across the lake, and he just suddenly died. And that whole time in the hospital, I'd never experienced a hospital in Medicare insurance. I've learned about that and being an advocate. And that was terrifying. And I had no, I thought my dad had worked his whole life, and they took such poor care of him, I thought. And, I, and my sister is like a bull in a china shop. So it was good to, even though she drives me crazy, it's great to have her there because she'd be like, you guys. She was just telling them they're awful and give me this person. She wasn't very, but she did make some things happen. But it just, it was scary how it wasn't there. It, it's a business. Hospitals are a business. And the more I learned about it, the more I was very like I really expected to be much more nurturing yeah. and this and that. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh my gosh, that was the biggest stress for me was when my dad was dying and dealing with the hospital and no one seemed to care and um, getting him out of there as soon as possible when we we're like he's dying and you're kicking him out and then no, and then telling them that he, my 80 year old mom had to take care of him who had no ability to do that, and we all live in our way, so we finally found a group of nurses that moved in, and it cost a ton of money until we put them on the hospice, and then it was, there are all these things you don't know, and I just, that's overwhelming, and you just don't know until you go through it. I'll be more prepared if it happens to my mom, but that was the most emotional, awful time, is the hospital thing. We're not educated with that, and that's most you of the time. And your social worker is your best medicine. You're supposed to be surrounded by professionals at that time, yes. and you're like, what are you people doing? Yes. <laughs> oh, I can't. Yeah. That's the scary. That story. was much harder than when I went through just with my mom, too, this or that. It was the whole, um, my dad being sick and dealing with the hospital. That was the scary part. There's no one, I didn't really find anyone, it was hard to find someone to help us. Because I think you had a social us. worker in the hospital, at least from our experience, was that they were not super helpful. <laughs> No, 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 but they, no, right. they do say right. that, yeah. you know, people say about, different, if you're lucky enough to have two parents at, at your age, you're only going to do this twice, you know, and, you're, and so you want to do it right, and you want to be prepared, and you, but often it is the first one that doesn't quite go right. Right. Exactly. But it'd be nice, and that's why something like this is important, because you can get some tips and you can do better, but yeah, that first hospital experience in oh, trauma, that's awful. That's good. We just, yeah. I mean, everyone has a different story there, but it's yeah. really good. Thanks. You think someone screwed up. Like my dad, we still think he'd probably be alive. All right? Because you think someone screwed no, up. Even though, even though yeah. it's probably not the case, but yeah. it's just so poorly. Like we, why isn't it better in America? I don't know. That could be a whole other thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That could be a whole other <laughs> talk. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have any um, can we didn't record the last one. Don't we have a problem? Yeah. Do you know, I'm going to do talk. Share your story. Oh, right. Thank you.